just want to introduce you quickly. Um, so you're the founder of Galdana, but you know, before that, I also know that you're one of Spain's most successful yeah. entrepreneur. Uh, you've been part of the Barcelona Football Club's board for many years. And, and you know, if we had more time, we would talk about Messi and all that stuff. But we're not, <laughs> we're not going to do that. Uh, yeah. And I know you're also a successful table tennis player. But having <laughs> said... <laughs> <laughs> All table, of that. Table tennis. The table, table, table tennis, tennis. exactly. <laughs> With that oh, no. background, Didak, why on earth did you come up with the idea of starting a venture fund of fund? Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, I've been an entrepreneur for 20 years. And uh, my company the last year did 300 million in revenues. I was very um, proud until I met uh, my, my best friend in China that he's doing like 20 billion uh, and he took the, uh, only 10 years. Uh, that day I realized that uh, from my, my country, from Spain, I can build a nice company, but probably I was not able to build a global player. And uh, that's why I, uh, I, 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 what I'm doing today is to invest in the best funds to have access to the best uh, companies. Got it. Hey, you know, we've chatted many times throughout the years. And, and you know, one, one uh, statement you made really stuck with me and actually became the headline of this discussion. And that is when you, co I would say, coined the phrase that venture capital is an access class and, and not an asset class, as many would say. What, what, what do you mean by that? Yeah, that uh, in our industry, a small percentage of startups are uh, achieving uh, the, um, uh, and delivering the, the, the most of the returns. So the key is not uh, to uh, invest uh, in, uh, in a lot of startups, you know, the key is to uh, be able uh, to invest in some of the best startups. So uh, that's why, uh, in my opinion, and this is more uh, about to having access. And uh, while we are investing in VCs, it's exactly the same, is to have access to the best VCs and the best VCs can access to the best uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, that's why uh, I truly believe that uh, we are talking about an uh, access class instead of uh, asset class. So um, I think, you know, some people would argue that historically, if you were an LP, you would be pretty well off if you were into, you know, I don't know, but say the seven, eight best venture funds in Silicon Valley. Benchmark, mm -hmm. at least historically, Kleiner Perkins, Sequoia, Andreessen, Greylock, a couple more. Th and then you would actually be you know, doing, doing fine. But then there's those that argue that, hey, the landscape is changing, both globally, we'll come back to that. But you also have a number of new managers coming in, single GP funds, micromanagers, really tiny seed funds, entrepreneur-led funds that they do on the side, uh, is this, you know, how do you think about that? And, and is it also access that matters in, in that category? Hmm. I guess there's no fixed rules uh, in our industry. But uh, what is true is that there's a significant amount of micro uh, VCs with the small uh, funds that are delivering amazing returns and uh, make decisions quicker. They have a proprietary deal flow from their uh, uh, former uh, career as an operator or, uh, or as an entrepreneur. And uh, it's true that there's a significant amount of uh, those players that are delivering great um, uh, returns. From, but from my experience, uh, investing in VCs, and in Silicon Valley, we invested uh, 20 VCs, and, and some of them, they are uh, the, the, the top names from the Sunset Road. 
Uh, we see that if you invest in the best franchises, you always get a consistent return. And probably in our, from our strategy, we are conservative. We love predictable uh, returns. We are not looking for a 5x. Uh, we, uh, for, with a 2 to 3x predictable with a 20% uh, net RRR, is, for us, is fine. And um, with a good DPI, of course, uh, because on paper, a lot of people uh, uh, have a nice TDPI, but uh, the, the DPI is, a, is what really matters. And in my opinion, investing in the uh, fortress funds and in the top franchises uh, in Europe, Silicon Valley, or uh, and in China, uh, you can have a consistent return. So uh, I, I think it's really intriguing to hear that, you know, an, an LP, to some extent, have the same challenge as, as uh, you know, as us, as a manager have, you know, it's really <laughs> about getting to the best. What are your, uh, what are your, you know, what's the strategy, what's the secret tricks of getting into the, the best managers out there? You know, which cards do you play? <laughs> I guess uh, it, it's a good question because uh, probably it's even harder. When I was an entrepreneur, for me, it was easier to access to the best funds than uh, when I been I am an LP and I'm trying to get into the best names. The reality is that the best managers uh, manage uh, pretty small uh, size funds. They are totally oversubscribed. Over, totally oversubscribed. There's no room. And uh, for me, uh, our strategy is very simple. The four partners of Galana, we, we are entrepreneurs. We've been um, investing uh, as a business angel uh, and uh, we source deals to our funds. Uh, we can provide uh, some intelligence in some uh, specific uh, themes in the digital world. And uh, we can help to develop the, uh, the, the portfolio of the, our GPs by making intros, doing business development, because we've been doing this for 20 years or, or more. And uh, that's our unique selling proposition and uh, that we try to be a partner to our uh, to the GPs that the money is a uh, commodity for them because they can raise all the money in the world. And we try to help them. And of course, uh, uh, we, uh, we are nice people. We are not a pain in the ass. We live in a small place uh, like Barcelona. And uh, we, are, uh, we host, uh, we treat very well our GPs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it feels like you know both Galdana and, and Crandon, We have this no asshole policy, which I think goes uh, goes a long way. Hey, so you know on manager selection, some things are easy, right? You look at mm -hmm. you look at the track record, but but what are the I don't know one or two things that are critical for you that you want to know about a partnership before you invest, even though mm -hmm. the numbers look good and have looked good for a long time. Mm -hmm. That that's a very good cool question. Uh, in our case, we, we believe that uh, BC is a people business and people are not a commodity. For us, uh, the teams are the most relevant factor uh, that when we are considering an investment. The, the track record for sure is something that we have, it's, uh, it's a must, but for us, is a due diligence of the team. Uh, that's why we try to meet all the partners. We try to uh, understand uh, the dynamics, the internal dynamics of um, of uh, the team. We try to uh, find out how they manage uh, the uh, how they do the decision making, how they plan to do the uh, the generational transitions. And we try to understand how they uh, treat entrepreneurs, how they uh, do deal sourcing, uh, and uh, uh, everything that is not only uh, that you cannot find in a data room. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, yeah. 
And sometimes uh, I think uh, you, uh, our previous experience as entrepreneurs, uh, and very quickly you can see is, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the strength of a partnership uh, in a venture capital. And uh, because mm. probably after doing that for 20 years, uh, you, you get some, uh, some knowledge. Mm. Got it. Great. So let's, let's change tack tack a bit and talk about you know different regions in in the world i think it's clear that you know since the 60s uh you know silicon valley was probably the best place in the world to create tech businesses but then something happened and you know china came uh in full force 20 25 years ago you know one, one could argue when it started and then you know you have europe um we're both from here and that has for long been, you know, the slumbering continent. You know, with your global perspective, you basically invest everywhere. What's mm -hmm. your, you know, naked assessment of, uh, of Europe? Yeah. In, you know, from our experience, uh, I think that uh, in Europe, we have an uh, amazing uh, breed of uh, entrepreneurs that... Uh, and uh, and this is something that is increasing uh, during the last years, uh, probably due the uh, because we have role models, uh, we have uh, talent incubators, and that and the European ecosystem is growing and is attracting a lot of talent and a lot of money, and uh, something that uh, for me is a great sign is that the top five uh, well. Four up to the top five VC firms in of the Silicon Valley are coming to in Europe. So uh, I think that's the best signaling that uh, Europe is uh, somewhere that they expect to hunt the, the next unicorns and probably the next decacorn uh, uh, as well. I think that the big trend of the of the uh, of uh, these times is that. The Silicon Valley is not only in Silicon Valley. Uh, Silicon Valley is more like a state of mind and you can find Silicon Valley in Europe as well. And of course in China. But having said this, uh, the exit routes and the market fragmentation uh, are still two big challenge uh, that the, Europeans, uh, the European ecosystem needs to overcome if they uh, want to shorten the distance with Silicon Valley and China. Yeah, yeah. And if we then, you know, within Europe, narrow our, our focus, you know, let, let's spend a short time also on the Nordics since, you know, this is the, the topic for, for this, this uh, conference. What, you know, for, as an outs outsider, so to say, what's your view of, of the Nordics? I'm a big fan of the Nordics. And uh, it's impressive uh, how uh, you guys develop uh, one of the most interesting uh, tech epicenters uh, of the world. Uh, I, I, I'm sure that this is due your educational uh, system that uh, the kids code from uh, the elementary school and the education uh, and all the po public policies around the innovation about the talent hubs uh, are, uh, uh, are are simply amazing that all the countries uh, from uh, this part of the world uh, are trying to follow so uh, th that's why we did uh, two strong bets uh, in this part uh, in the nordics and we are extremely happy with the performance that uh, we are uh, getting uh, from the from here. Great. Okay. Hey, time is is running fast, um, and um, we also uh, on the initiative of Arctic Fifteen said we're going to turn the tables a little bit and and see <laughs> if uh, Didac has any questions for for me as a GP. Yeah, so the floor is sure. Yours. Sure. Uh, a lot of, uh, how do you get access to the top 1% uh, startups in the ecosystem? 
It's interesting you mentioned 1% because I, I usually say that if you as a VC only see the 99%, you know, you should stop doing what you're doing immediately because it's all about seeing that top top 1%. And, you know, it, 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 it's hard, right? It's, uh, it's not something that comes automatic. What we try to do is, is a combination of a number of different things. So you want to have a strong brand and that brand is always a combination of individual brands you have in your firm and the firm brand. Mm -hmm. Then, and this is something you build over time that becomes your moat, I would say, that's actually the portfolio, right? If you have a number of strong brands in your portfolio, entrepreneurs will be, want to be associated with that and they want to be part of that network because then they can access other great uh, entrepreneurs. Now, I think this business is also changing. We're, we're making use of software uh, to find signals in the market. We're spending a unproportionate amount of time of reaching out to, uh, to entrepreneurs. And you know, at one point in time, we had statistics that showed that overall 95% of all entrepreneurs contact us, but in the ones where Crandon eventually invest, we have reached out in almost half the cases. Hmm. Uh, um, but very interesting. And uh, about the brands, it's very similar. Uh, what is happening with a top brand from the venture capital when you compare it with a football club or a top business school. Uh, if you ask anybody in which uh, team do you want to play, they will say, you know, probably the same top three. Or if you want to study in a business school, uh, they will say the same top three. And uh, I would like to ask you about what are the key indicators that you look in an entrepreneur or a startup before considering an investment? Yeah, so I, I see Camilla up to the right here on my screen, which <laughs> means that I need to do this relatively quick. But hey, let me give you three, four things. Okay. So first, we, we want them to, to obviously, we want them to have achieved something else. And you may think, well, hey, you know, if I'm, if I'm a young entrepreneur, how is it possible for me to have done something? But, you know, if you actually go through what you have done, you're usually able to see that they have achieved things, even in high school or in their okay. football club, etc. right? Secondly, we want them to be able to speak what we call intelligent, intelligent about their business, about their competitors, about the market, about the evolution. And third, something that, that I think you need is you need to be obsessed. You need to be mm. absolutely you know, fulfilled and obsessed about getting mm. to that vision of your company. And there are many more you know, things, but if I were to pick three, that's probably the, the three.